thank you. I welcome you <clears throat> all very much. And I would like to preface my uh, actual <clears throat> speech with uh, a short report about what Mr. LaRouche had to say yesterday, <clears throat> because we had yesterday extremely breaking developments. <clears throat> President Obama <clears throat> went to the Congress and tried to really threaten the Democratic Party members of the Congress <clears throat> in telling them that they absolutely had to vote for the TP, uh, a, TPA, it's now called, uh, <clears throat> and that this was not on the question of the free trade pact, but it was a question on him. So uh, reports were, <clears throat> when um, this 40-minute session was over, members of Congress came out completely furious <clears throat> and then voted with an overwhelming majority against this uh, TPP uh, uh, proposition, which is really a major defeat, uh, one more of the many defeats of Obama in the recent period. And Mr. LaRouche commented and said, this is re reflection not of a last minute opposition, but uh, this is a process of rebellion going on in the last uh, period uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and it reflects uh, much more an awareness of important factions uh, that we are in the danger of an immediate uh, nuclear war. So he said that <clears throat> that means that for the next period, one has to expect even an increase in the inclination of uh, the Obama administration to push the confrontation, uh, but um, that the real reason has to be addressed, and that is that the Wall Street is on the chopping block that the entire transatlantic financial system is hopelessly, hopelessly bankrupt and <clears throat> that um, you know, the only hope is in the existence of a block of nations who are numerically uh, much stronger. Uh, however, uh, that what has to be also avoided is a plunge of the world into chaos and that therefore we need a program uh, which immediately addresses the situation because you have the impending blowout of the Greek uh, <clears throat> debt, uh, which had, would have an immediate consequence for uh, Spain, Italy, and <clears throat> that even if Germany is in a relatively stronger position, we are looking at the breakdown of the entire transatlantic financial system. And that therefore the kinds of measures have to be taken, like Franklin D. Roosevelt did in the period from 32 to 39, and that that is uh, you know, what we have to concentrate on, and I think that is something what the deliberations of this conference uh, must uh, deal with, because this is not an academic conference, this is an actual effort to intervene in a moment when it is very clear that the leading institutions of the G7, for example, which just met in their summit, have absolutely failed to address these existential dangers of civilization. Now, I will come back to these optimistic solutions, but let me tell you, you know, the, mankind has never been at such a dangerous moment. However, I want to, in the beginning, express my conviction that I think it is absolutely possible to save civilization and realize the very beautiful options and alternatives which will be the subject of this discussion. That we will be, uh, if we do our job right, and obviously it will not only depend on us, but our subjective intervention, I think will be the marginal difference if mankind goes into annihilation or into a new era of civilization that we could have very soon a completely different world. And I think it's important to start with the vision of where we want to go uh, because you know, we could have a completely different relations among nations, not focused on geopolitical confrontation, not focusing on so-called narrow national interests versus the national interest of some other country, but where we would be united for the common aims of mankind. That we could have a new world economic order which would give justice to every nation on this planet, 
combined with a classical renaissance of culture, which in my view is equally urgent if you look at the degeneracy of the Western culture at this point. But that can only be realized <coughs> if we succeed to realize the task which we have set out for us quite some while ago, namely that we get the European nations and the United States in a cooperative mode with the BRICS nations and the win-win policy of President Xi Jinping of China. First slide, please. Now, this <coughs> is the program, a blueprint for the next, I don't know, 50 years. Maybe, you know, if you look at the speed of developments in China, maybe it takes only 20 years, but it could also be the next 100 years. Uh, it is really the key, this program of building a world land bridge, uniting all the nations on the planet in a common development strategy, is really the <clears throat> uh, way how to really overcome all problems. The war danger, because it would represent a peace strategy for the 21st century, the underdevelopment and hunger of billions of people, because it would provide development and production for, for all of them. It would eliminate or help to eliminate the drug plate, and it would especially give hope for the future and therefore overcome the decadence of the minds. However, this shift has to occur very, very summit, uh, suddenly, very, because it's very urgent. If you look at the results of the re recent G7 uh, summit, um, well, you have a situation where, unfortunately, Chancellor Merkel, pushed by Obama, Cameron, and, and Canada, excluded President Putin for the second time, uh, and that action of Mrs. Merkel created the forum for <clears throat> Obama's very provocative attacks at the end of the summit. Now, given the fact that the G7 only represent about 10% of the world population, I find it quite enormous that they decided to implement a so-called decarbonization of the world economy until the year 2100. Uh, now, who authorizes 10% of the world population to define the program of the entire world for, you know, in 90 years from now? Now, Mrs. Merkel, uh, if history will rem remember her, uh, she will probably go into history for her very infamous exit from nuclear energy uh, and the sole reliance on <coughs> renewable energies. Now, uh, decarbon decarbonization would mean only have solar and wind, no fossil fuel uh, energy resources, and since they are also against nuclear energy in Germany, well, it basically would mean, as uh, <clears throat> Mr. Schellenhuber, who is the head of the uh, WBGU in Germany, an advisory institution, but also a CBE, commander of the British Empire, uh, he has developed this program of the transformation of the global economy, uh, which would be decarbonization uh, of the world economy, and if you realize that there is a direct correlation between the energy flux density in the production process and the number of people which can be carried with that energy flux density, you have to come to the conclusion that the approximate number of people who could be maintained is about one billion people. Now, <clears throat> um, then there was this very ominous meeting between President Obama and Sir David Attenborough, the next slide, uh, the third slide, not the second. No, no, the, the, the third one, this one. Yeah, this is Sir David Attenborough, who is the key advisor for environmental and energy questions uh, to uh, the British uh, Crown. He was flown in by Obama <coughs> shortly before the G7 summit. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, basically it was not made public what they discussed, but we know um, what, uh, what Attenborough has said 
in the past, namely that mankind is a plague, uh, that you know we should reduce it massively by at least half. Uh, and so you can assume that you know what went into this summit in, on the side of Obama was the British advice on how to reduce population. Now, fortunately, there are three important German personalities uh, who have been intervening shortly before the G7 summit that President Putin should be invited. This is very importantly the acting foreign minister uh, Steinmeier, uh, the former chancellors Gerhard Schröder and Helmut Schmidt, and Helmut Schmidt in particular said not only Russia should be invited to the G7 summit, but also China and India. And Schmidt, who is 95 years old, uh, and it seems to be the quality of older people that they are more courageous to speak the truth um, than many times younger people, he had warned of World War III many, many times before. So you can be assured that these people, Steinmeier in that sense really being on a completely different track than Merkel, uh, that these people know uh, the warnings which military experts in the recent period uh, have uh, expressed, namely that we are today in a situation which is more dangerous then the height of the Cold War. And the height of the Cold War was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you had, despite the extremely adversary relations, you had uh, communications between President Kennedy and Khrushchev, and they were able to defuse the crisis in the very last moment. <clears throat> now, that is not the case between uh, President Obama and President Putin. I mean, that has been noted by, by many military experts that the biggest danger, or one of the biggest danger, is that there is no communication between the United States <coughs> and uh, Russia in particular. Now, how did we get to this crisis? This has been the result of a long-term build-up which really started with the decision of the neocons uh, in 1997 to go for the policy of the PNEC, the Project for a New American Century, uh, which was the idea <clears throat> that, you know, especially when then uh, the Soviet Union uh, disintegrated uh, between 89 and 91, uh, that there should be no country not being part of an empire run by the Anglo-Americans based on the special relationship between Great Britain and the United States. And it explicitly noted that <coughs> the, the goal was to maintain a US global preeminence precluding the rise of a power or a group of nations to <coughs> uh, challenge the power of the United States. And it is that concept which exists it was only briefly interrupted halfway uh, in the Clinton period. It was fully carried on by Bush senior, Bush junior, two administrations, and now by <coughs> six and a half years of Obama. So what this policy meant is that immediately following the collapse of the Soviet Union, <coughs> they went into policies of regime change uh, through a variety of measures uh, color revolution, paying NGOs with the aim to topple the democratically e elected government uh, <clears throat> with policies of sanctions. We see it in the case of Russia where the explicit aim of these sanctions is to cause so much uproar inside Russia that you would have a, a Maidan phenomena in Moscow and uh, <clears throat> getting rid of Putin. Uh, it included the NATO and EU expansion to the borders of Russia, which according to John Medlock, who was the, Russian, uh, the American ambassador in Moscow during the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, promises were given that this would never happen. These promises were never uh, kept. And it means the <clears throat> uh, troop and military equipment forward positioning at the Russian borders. And now, very recently, you have the extremely flimsy accusation that Russia would have violated the INF Treaty uh, <clears throat> and that there could be 
um, that this could be related to uh, an alleged test launch of a sea-based cruise missile from a launcher on land, which, you know, if it ever happened or something similar, would have been an extremely minor technical uh, thing. But as I said, it's not even uh, proven. The Russian side has maintained very clearly that there is no proof. And the deputy defense minister, Anton Antonov, uh, basically has uh, said the U.S. is ramping up these allegations against Russia to justify their own military plans uh, to return the U.S. short- and medium-range missiles to Europe and other regions. Now, when Obama came into office, he had promised that he would reduce nuclear weapons and, you know, eventually <coughs> uh, get rid of them. But now to put nuclear weapons back into Great Britain, which already happily accepted in the person of Cameron and other places, is a, really a push for nuclear war. And some people think it should be nuclear war in Europe, but by the logic of nuclear war, it would not be just for Europe. It would be a generalized uh, global thermal nuclear war where nobody would survive. General Ivashov, who is right now the head of the Academy of Geopolitics, said this is a Cuba missile crisis in reverse. And it is <clears throat> the uh, acting out of the cheney wolfowitz doctrine of a unipolar world. Now, the Obama administration <clears throat> uh, admitted that they are considering an option of, a, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, to, uh, of leaving the INF Treaty, deploying a so-called counterforce IRBMs, interrange ballistic missiles to Europe, or even a countervailing strike capability involving the possibility of a preemptive nuclear attack uh, on targets inside of Russia. Now, also the transformation of the military doctrines in the last period, prompt global strike, the US ballistic missile system, are de facto first strike doctrines. And if you remember what President Putin said when he announced the upgrade of the Russian military doctrine over the Christmas period, he said there may come a point where Russia feels compelled to use nuclear weapons to avoid this danger. Well, that should show you why we are really in mortal danger and absolutely must act. The NATO website uh, presently lists 71 maneuvers and events between April and November, uh, <clears throat> all close to the Russian border, in the Baltics, in the Baltic Sea, in the Black Sea, and <clears throat> Poroshenko, uh, just announced that he is ending uh, all military cooperation with Russia, uh, which blocks the uh, supply of Russian troops in Transnistria, uh, Moldova. <clears throat> and this is, on the surface, could be a repeat of the events of Georgia in 2008, but it could also be a pretext, uh, <clears throat> you know, used for uh, actions against Russia. Russia intensifies its strategic ties with uh, China and India, and Russia and China are drilling their airborne uh, amphibious uh, <clears throat> troops in, uh, in the Far East in a maneuver called Joint Sea 2015. In light of the fact that the pretext for all of this escalation against Russia uh, is <clears throat> uh, the Ukraine situation, uh, you know, supposedly the Crimea issue, but it should be absolutely noted what triggered this event was on the one side the fascist coup on the February 27th in February 2014. Before that, the effort to incorporate Ukraine into the EU through the EU Association Agreement. And even before that, which uh, I fully support, um, <coughs> Helmut Schmidt saying that the real Ukraine crisis started with the Maastricht Treaty because this is where the idea of having, having an eastward expansion of the EU uh, really started. So what happened, therefore, at the G7 <clears throat> meeting, you could only call a suicidal delirium on the side of Germany, France, Italy, and other nations. So the only chance uh, is <clears throat> that the opposition of Steinmeier, Schmidt, and Schröder has to be escalated 
Merkel, in my view, should be replaced because she violates the oath of office to protect the German people against perils and her scandalous behavior in the NSA BND affair, uh, <clears throat> which violates the rights of all German uh, people, uh, <clears throat> and you know, not only the German people, because you know, the BND NSA collaboration uh, spied against France, against uh, Belgium, uh, Austria, even the German own industry. Uh, <clears throat> and um, she obviously doesn't know that the German economy without cooperation with Russia and the BRICS does not function. Now, Russia is part of Europe, and the sanctions designed to harm Russia uh, <clears throat> are really extremely stupid because it not only hurts Russia, which uh, you know, obviously is suffering uh, of it, but for example, in the first quarter of this year, the German machi machine tool uh, exports to Russia collapsed by 28%, and the German industry is extremely furious that the US export to Russia in the same time increased by 17%. Now, <coughs> there is um, <coughs> basically um, not only uh, stagnation in the economy uh, of Europe, but uh, <coughs> there is right now nothing to protect all of Europe from disintegration, uh, especially in light of the pending explosion of the Greek situation, which seems clearly to come to a head. So Merkel should be either forced out or she should completely be reined in, um, subdued, uh, by forces in Germany uh, from industry, the military, and a larger faction uh, in the SPD represented by these three individuals. Uh, <clears throat> but we should also you know, be aware that it, it has been, as long as the United States are on this geopolitical uh, <clears throat> idea, you know, which goes back a century long, if not longer, to prevent collaboration of Germany and, and Russia, um, I think that th what needs to be done, and, and it is not just a, a task of Germany, but all of Europe has to make sure that the sanctions are ended right away, and it's very easy. All we have to say is we start trading with Russia again, and that would be the very first step uh, to get back to uh, normality. But <coughs> the declaration uh, of um, decarbonization and economic warfare against Russia are not the only terrible evils which were agreed upon at the G7 summit. They decided on a hard line against Greece, uh, <coughs> a, a austerity policy to the total advantage of the too big to fail banks. And one should note that 97% of all the so-called rescue packages uh, <coughs> really went Oh, we should take this away because <laughs> this is <clears throat> um, uh, should be 97% <clears throat> um, uh, of all the rescue packages uh, really went back to the banks. And what is being imposed on Greece is the kind of uh, debt dungeon or debt corset in the tradition of Versailles, Treaty, and Brüning. Um, and Jean Siegler, who is a, a prominent Swiss uh, activist and UN representative, basically said the modern slaveholders are sitting in the upper floors of the banks and multinationals. And he called the present system of globalization cannibalistic. And that is absolutely uh, true. Now, your average Eurocentrist will say, oh, Mr. Ziegler is too radical. But if you think about it, is it not true? What is the difference between the ships of the slave traders and plantation owners of the Confederacy where thousands of people drowned or died of hunger and thirst and the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean where many thousands of people uh, almost every week are risking their life and that of their children having a 50% chance of not making it uh, running away from wars in the Middle East, starva starvation and epidemics in Africa, and terrorism. The EU policy on refugees, for me, reflects the total moral bankruptcy of that institution. 
because they are only serving the interest of the too big to fail and the IMF, which are uh, running by the interests, which basically uh, have turned the whole developing sector into a plantation. If you think about the land grab, speculation on scarcity of water, uh, blocking water management projects with the purpose to have high water prices, to speculate on bottled water, uh, controlling the food chain. Uh, food chain. Jean Siegler uh, said that every child which dies of hunger uh, is murder. And I agree, because it would be so easy uh, to, to solve it. It would take half a year, and you could eliminate that from happening. A few days ago on the plane, I watched the movie 12 Years a Slave, which is a remarkable movie, and I normally don't encourage people to watch movies, but this one is very <coughs> advisable, because it captures the mentality of the slaveholders um, <coughs> which are today, uh, a, ten a mentality which is today alive and kicking in the US pro-British tendency. Behind this unipolar world outlook, uh, in reality, is in reality the, uh, the mentality of plantation owners and slaveholders in a modern form. Granted, the CEOs of too big to fail banks and the EU bureaucrats don't probably have this perverse lust uh, which is portrayed in this movie, where you, know, you can really say that the sadism and, and, and absolute disgusting uh, <clears throat> mentality is, is really uh, bringing you to the borders of what human beings human being should be able to do. But nevertheless, there are the masterminds the <clears throat> behind the desks, there are the perpetrators at the desks. Uh, they speculate with CO2 certificates, and they couldn't care less about the consequences of their policies. As long as they have profit, what happens to the people as a result, they are completely indifferent. A bit now the second picture, Attenborough, the, the second picture. Now behind these are the Attenbergs. Uh, can you please put the second slide on? No, the second slide. This is the, no, the sec, yeah, that one. Now here you have Mr. Attenberg, uh, who said that human beings are the humans, uh, that we humans are the plague on the earth. And uh, that we have to fight the explosion uh, in human numbers. Uh, he is associated with the so-called Optimum Population Fund, uh, <clears throat> which um, is uh, uh, basically said that the present number of people on the planet has to be reduced before the end of the century uh, to half. That would be 3.5 billion. Um, and um, yeah, so he, yeah, two people, so he probably figures out which of the two should be eliminated because you have to take it very, very personal. Now, um, <clears throat> Friedrich Schiller, in the very beautiful writing, The Legislation of Solon and Likorg, uh, portrayed Sparta as the oligarchical model, in which he said the oligarchical model ha can have the elimination of the so-called helots. They can be killed off if there are too many. Bertrand Russell, uh, in the impact of the article, The Impact of Science on Society, Bertrand Russell, next slide, please, uh, <clears throat> said, um, bad times, you may say, are exceptional and can be dealt with by exceptional methods. This has been more or less true during the honeymoon period of industrialism, but it will not remain true unless the increase of population can be enormously diminished. At present, the population of the world is increasing at about 58,000 per diem. War so far has had no great effect on this increase, which continued through each of the world wars. War has hitherto been disappointing in this respect, but perhaps bacteriological war may prove more efficient. If a black death could spread throughout the world once in every gener generation, survivors could pro procreate more freely without making the world too full. The state of affairs may, might be somewhat unpleasant, but what of it? 
really high-minded people are indifferent to happiness, especially to other peoples. The white population of the world will soon cease to increase. The Asiatic races will be longer and the Negroes still longer before their birth rate falls sufficiently to make their numbers stable without help of war and pestilence. Until that happens, the benefits aimed at socialism can only be partially realized, and less prolific races will have to defend themselves against the more prolific methods which are disgusting, even if they are necessary. With that mindset, a splendid little war, as the British always used to call it, just seems to be the right thing, even a splendid little nuclear war. It may be disgusting, but necessary. Now, fortunately, there is an alternative. Since about two years ago, <clears throat> when President Xi Jinping announced the new Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road, and especially since the Fortaleza summit in July 2014, there is a completely different economic system. The BRICS have made among themselves an enormous number of deals, areas of cooperation involving infrastructure, science and technology, nuclear energy, uh, space development, uh, worth of several trillions of euro, dollar, and so forth. Now, from the standpoint of European habits of the last couple of years, these countries have done so with an unbelievable speed. Uh, and the organizations, uh, other organizations have coalesced around the BRICS, all of Latin America, most of ASEAN, parts of Africa, and even Europe. Uh, with Chinese help, they are now building a second Panama Canal in Nicaragua. Uh, the Chinese are helping to build a transcontinental railway between Brazil and Peru. Uh, this was concluded at the recent visit of uh, Prime Minister Li Keqiang in, in Latin America. And they are also building four tunnels uh, between Chile and Argentina, all with direct Chinese investment. But beyond that, they have created a completely parallel financial system. The New Development Bank, uh, ground capital $100 billion, uh, the currency reserve, uh, arrangement, which is a pool to def defend participating countries against speculation, the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, where contrary to the wishes of the Obama administration, 58 nations rushed to be founding members, including France, Germany, Italy, Scandinavia, and others. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization has a new bank, so does the SARC, the South Asian uh, organization. There is a new Silk Road Development Fund, a Maritime Silk Road Fund, and they all have the explicit aim to, to fill the vacuum which has been left by the IMF and the World Bank, uh, who only spend $60 billion uh, <clears throat> a year for infrastructure investment, uh, <clears throat> and therefore <clears throat> uh, the, the, uh, you know, these banks have now uh, engaged in an effort to invest in huge infrastructure development programs all over the de developing sector. Now, the main impetus of this clearly came from the Chinese President Xi Jinping, uh, <clears throat> but there is also an extremely strong uh, pa strategic partnership between Russia and China. Uh, <clears throat> the new Silk Road uh, uh, and one road, one belt policy uh, has in the recent period completely integrated with the Eurasian Economic Union of Russia. Uh, there is an extreme close strategic cooperation between Russia and India. And at a recent visit of President Putin in India, uh, President Modi said that India and Russia are united by the strongest uh, strategic partnership uh, in respect to security in the past, and it will be like that for the indefinite future. Also, between India and China, uh, the uh, strategic partnership has been strengthened and territorial and other conflicts have been put on ice. Uh, at the visit of Li Keqiang in Brazil, 
a couple of weeks ago, he was able to completely reverse a strategic attack on Brazil by Wall Street uh, and stop uh, the destabilization efforts against Dilma Rousseff. So there is right now emerging a completely different model of relations among nations based on completely different principles, not so completely different because they used to be the property of the United Nations uh, before this uh, <clears throat> imperial policy took over, like non-interference, respect for the different social model, mutual economic uh, benefit, a win-win policy. Obviously, this new model of economy has an enormous attractiveness and it has led to an eruption of optimism. Projects which have been on the shelf in many countries have been taken off and are now being realized. The Chinese economic miracle has become contagion. China, since the reforms of Deng Xiaoping, and especially in the last 30 years, has made a development of a breathtaking speed and was able to do what the industrialized nations needed for 150 to 200 years. China, contrary to the coverage in the Western media, has the best human rights record in the world because they have transformed 800 million people from extreme poverty into a very decent living standard. And what is more a human rights violation than poverty? Now, with the new Silk Road, China is intending to also overcome the not yet developed parts in the interior region uh, and uh, upgrading the living standard of the rural population. They have announced that they want to double the GDP from 2010 to 2020. Now, that is a remarkable uh, goal, and it is believable if you look what, what happened in the last 30 years. Now, for us in the Schiller Institute, the new Silk Road policy is a realization of a vision which we started to develop 25 years ago. At the time of the fall of the wall, we proposed at that time uh, <coughs> to unite the region between Paris, Berlin, and Vienna into the so-called productive triangle because the wall was no longer there. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, next slide, uh, <coughs> we extended that productive triangle into the so-called Eurasian land bridge. Uh, this was the idea to unite the industrial and population centers of Europe with those of Asia through so-called development uh, infrastructure corridors. But it was not only meant as an uh, economic program, it was deliberately meant as a peace order for the 21st century. Now, the, European, uh, the Eurasian land bridge was the idea to have a higher order of region, reason where historic conflicts, tensions, uh, ethnic tensions, and so forth, wounds of battles of the past would be overcome because there would be a mutual benefit for everybody to participate in this uh, program. It was really, even if we didn't call it that way, a win-win policy. Now, naturally, it did not get realized because of the reason I just said, the project for a new American century, the efforts by Bush Sr., Margaret Thatcher, and Mitterrand to force Germany at the time of the German unification to give up the d -mark for the Euro uh, and the Maastricht uh, Treaty. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, because it was up to 89, uh, the so-called best kept secret of NATO, that Germany was still an occupied country and the Maastricht Treaty should assure that Germany would remain an occupied country by uh, containment through self-containment, by putting Germany into the straitjacket of the stability pact, the debt break, and it was clear to us that the euro could not function because it was not designed to be an economic program, it was a geopolitical uh, attack on Germany. Now, in the meantime, uh, we conducted uh, hundreds of conferences and seminars on five continents. And in 96, at a conference of the <clears throat> uh, in Beijing on the Eurasian land bridge, 
uh, you know, that was that program was de facto put on the agenda by the Chinese government to be the strategic perspective for the year 2010. Uh, and naturally, that got interrupted by the Asia crisis in 97, the Russian state bankruptcy in 98. Therefore, we were overjoyed, but not fundamentally surprised, when, <clears throat> um, when Xi Jinping announced the new Silk Road. Now, for about two years, the mainstream media has completely ignored the fact that such a parallel economic system is developing, or they slandered it by giving Putin a bad name or Xi Jinping. Ping. Next slide. But for, but for the last four weeks, next slide. Uh, uh, no, this was the transcontinental railway. Next slide. Yeah. Since the past four weeks, you have a flood of articles. Time magazine, New Silk Road could change global economics forever. Uh, <clears throat> uh, greatest, next slide, great infrastructure projects in history. Uh, this could change. Uh, this is a great game over the control of Eurasia. Uh, it could lead to a new Cold War. The outcome is uncertain. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, this is Deutschlandfunk. Anyway, so most of these articles are all of a sudden saying there is a completely new system, but you know it is really still geopolitics, and they completely miss the point that this is explicitly a way to overcome geopolitics by inviting everybody in the whole world to participate. Now, they also say China must have a secret agenda. They want to take over the world. They want to replace Anglo-American imperialism with a Chinese imperialism. And <clears throat> uh, it is very clear that the journalists and politicians of the transatlantic region have an extremely hard time to imagine that it could have governments who are devoted to the common good. Because we have not had such governments for such a long time that it's almost a past memory. And it reminds me of uh, Hegel's uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> word in the um, uh, book um, the, where he says that the world historical individual who has a valet, um, <clears throat> you know, a butler, uh, <clears throat> that the valet who sees the world historical individual always only in his underwear cannot imagine that he is a world historical individual. But he says, this is not uh, the problem of the world historical individual, but of the fact that the valet is a valet. Now, the key to understand the real motives of China is Confucius. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> Confucius has, uh, <clears throat> together with Mencius, uh, really influenced the Chinese philosophy, actually Chinese state philosophy, since about 2,500 years. And it has an image of man, that man is good by nature, and key notions of the Chinese philosophy are Ren, which is the corresponding idea of agape, love, charity in the Christian tradition, and the idea of Li, uh, meaning principle, which is the idea that if each person and each thing develops uh, in the best possible way, you have harmony in society. This corresponds to the idea of Nicholas of Kuhs, um, the microcosm, where if each microcosm develops in the best way, you have uh, concordance, or the idea of the monad of Leibniz. Uh, that if each develops their fullest potential, you have harmony. Now, the idea of har harmony is very central to Confucian philosophy. It is not a static relationship, but a contrapuntal development of mutual uh, development forward. If all microcosms develop in the optimal way, you have harmony in the macrocosm. There is also the idea that there is such a thing like a mandate of heaven, that there must be a harmony between nature and man. And this comes originally from the idea of God's will of the Western Shu dynasty from two, uh, 1046 to 771 BC, uh, which said that there must be a, 
and ha a harmony between the heavens and man, and that they are closely related. Uh, this, by the way, <clears throat> exists in all great religions and philosophies. You have the same idea in the idea of a cosmology in India coming from the Hindu uh, tradition. You have it in the form of natural law in the European tradition. And <clears throat> it is really what we have to come to as humanity if we are to overcome the present uh, level of thinking. Harmony without uniformity uniformity is what Confucius writes in the Analects of Confucius. Unity in diversity is the idea with Nicolaus of Kuhs. In the Book of Rights, which is the preface to the great learning uh, <clears throat> of uh, Confucius, it's attributed to him, he says, the ancients wishing that all men under the heaven keep their inborn happiness, virtue unobscured, first have to govern the nation well, to govern the nation well, they first have to establish harmony in the household. Wishing to establish harmony in the household, they first have to cultivate themselves. Wishing to cultivate themselves, they first have to set their mind in the right. Wishing to set their minds in the right, they first uh, have to develop sincerity of thought. Wishing to have sincerity of thought, they first extend their knowledge to the utmost. The extension of knowledge in the utmost lies in the full, fully apprehending of the principle of things. Now, in order to have harmony in society and among nations is based on an understanding of the principles of things. This is the same idea Friedrich Schiller has in the Aesthetical Letters that only scientists and classical artists understand the truth. Xi Jinping, in the governance of China, which is a collection of 71 of his speeches, 2013 and 14, uh, reflects on this Confucian spirit. He quotes an ancient Chinese saying, saying, Le learning is the bow, while competence is the arrow. You should regard learning as the top priority, a responsibility, a moral support and a lifestyle. You should establish a conviction that dreams start from learning. She said, this is what Confucius meant when he said, if you can in, what, if you can in one day renovate yourself, do so from day to day. Yes, let there be daily renovation. Life never favors those who follow the beaten track and are satisfied with the status quo, and <clears throat> it never waits uh, for the unambitious and those who sit idle and enjoy the fruits of others' works. Now, <clears throat> this is what Lyndon LaRouche says to us every day, that we cannot do today what we did yesterday, and that each day we have to be creative and innovative. Xi Jinping quotes Victor Hugo, uh, who said, things created are insignificant when compared with things to be created. China has been able to progress step by step over centuries thanks to the tenacity of generations one after another and to the nation's spirit of constant self-improvement through hard work. Innovation-based economy is what China is aiming at and already uh, realizing, not to have made in China, but created in China. Xi Jinping demanded breakthroughs in basic scientific fields, such as the structure of matter, the evolution of the universe, the origin of life, and the nature of consciousness. Where lies the new road? It lies in the scientific and technological innovation, the acceleration of innovation-driven growth. And China also said, or he said, that they are proud to have the most scientists and engineers in the world. But I was most impressed when I found this quote uh, <clears throat> by Xi Jinping. Like the spring drizzle falling without a sound, we should disseminate the core socialist values in a gentle and lively way by making use of all kinds of cultural forms. 
We should inform the people by means of fine literary works and artistic images. What is the true, the good, and the beautiful? What is the false, the evil, and the ugly? And what should be praised and encouraged, and what should be opposed and repudiated? Now, I wish we would have in Europe and in the United States politicians who call for the implementation of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Because the idea that there is a coherence between those, the true, the good, and the beautiful, that was the idea of the ancient Greek classics, that there is a noble truth that man is good, that when he is a truth-seeking individual, and what he then discovers is beauty, as well that the process of discovery is beautiful. The idea of the true, the good, and the beauty is the essence of the German classical period. And Friedrich Schiller said, art is only art if it is beautiful, because only then does it elevate the human soul. Now, by that definition, most of what is being produced today does not classify as art, because it's not beautiful. Because the idea of beauty is an idea derived from reason, not from sensuous experience. Schiller is emphatic on that, that you do not define beauty by your opinion, your likings, but that there is an idea of beauty associated with reason, but that at the same time it appeals to the senses through, and that through the aesthetical education, beauty becomes the synonym for the happy reconciliation between reason and sensuousness, that in beauty, matters harmonize. For Friedrich Schiller, the highest idea of man was the beautiful soul, for whom freedom and necessity, passion and duty are one. But also the analogy between beauty and freedom uh, is uh, pretty, pretty obvious, because both are not determined from the outside, but from the inside. The greatest idea of self-determination reflects itself from certain characteristics of nature, and that we call beauty. But beauty is also, according to Schiller, a necessary condition of mankind. The state is only the means. The goal is alone humanity. The ideal of the state presumes, therefore, the <clears throat> ideal of mankind, and the ideal of mankind is based on the laws of the beautiful. Schiller in, 19, in 1789 writes to his friend Körner, what is the life of man if you take away what art gives to him? An eternally discovered site of destruction. Because if you take out of our life what is serving beauty, the only thing remaining is the need. And what is need other than the protection against the always threatening demise? Schiller with that <clears throat> uh, most convincingly argues against uh, <clears throat> the state whose only purpose is, is the maintenance of power, which is what the state is today. The politicians have no interest in beauty or the perfection of their people, but to keep their job, to keep their position. But only when the beautiful has become the purpose in the life of people and nations and avoid the necessity to organize everything on a protection against the permanently threatening, threatening doom, you have humanity. The condition of the West, especially in the United States after September 11, which you know, we should really look from the standpoint of the soon to be published 28 pages revealing who really financed uh, the uh, terrorist attack. Uh, <clears throat> oh, <laughs> um, the um, DIA documents pertaining to what happened really in the Benghazi attack. Uh, the war against terrorism has become a hydra, uh, where basically, uh, you know, the life has become quite miserable uh, by only protecting against the threats of terrorism. Therefore, this new model of cooperation among nations is not a utopia, but a vision of the future. And the big difference is that 
the closest thinkers in European uh, philosophical tradition to Confucius, Nicolaus of Kuhs, uh, who created an epochal new uh, philosophical approach, which really separated the Middle Ages from the modern times. He said the principle bringing about order and wholeness, the idea of concordance, of a universal concordance in the universe, is that harmony is not a static thing, but in a contrapuntal way, the different microcosms must develop each other to the fullest to the benefit of the other. The win-win idea, also the principle of the peace of Westphalia. Why is it that some people can see and believe in this vision and others cannot? It's an epistemological problem. Cusanus uh, makes the distinction between ratio, what Lyndon LaRouche calls practical people, and the intellect and reason. On the level of the ratio, the understanding, uh, you have the level, level of Aristotelian contradictions uh, of what we perceive with the sentence, senses. The intellect, however, reason, transcends ratio, the ratio. The intellect is situated as an undestructible prescience. It is our eye for the search of truth. If we don't have that, we would not even start the search, or even if we find something, we wouldn't know if that is what we searched for. The intellect is an intuitive insight which allows us to see the coherences and conceptions of causal relations, of connectivities. It is a new method of thinking, completely different from the discursive way of thinking. The Aristotelian practical man, according to Nicolaus von Kuhs, is like a horse tied to a feeding trough who only eats what is put in the trough. If you are on the level of the intellect, you have to free yourself from established opinions to be open for new thinking. And one has to break free from the trough. You can't do anything anyway. That is what most Europeans say when you talk to them about that. But it's not true. Why should Europe go along with a policy like the US nuclear missiles in Europe, which only makes Europe the target of its own extinction? Why should we get drawn into another war based on lies? The lies of those uh, who, uh, around the Ukraine crisis. The truth must come out of that. It is not enough to oppose the war, uh, but we have to do maybe what Charles de Gaulle did in 1966, namely disassociating from NATO. More important, we have to implement these existing solutions. We have to mobilize like nothing in our lifetime before to get the European nations and the United States to join with the World Land Bridge and to create a peace order for the 21st century. By joining the new Silk Road and the World Land Bridge, it is not only <coughs> to cooperate with the developing countries and like Africa and Latin America to develop them, but we need to be, rebuild the United States. We need to have a transcontinental fast train system across the United States because the infrastructure in the United States has completely collapsed. We have to declare a war on the desert because California, Texas, the states west of the Mississippi are being destroyed by drought. We have to uh, do what Modi, Prime Minister Modi of India said, we have to build 100 new smart cities, which we called many years ago Cusano cities. It's the idea, anyway, it goes too far to discuss this now. We have to build up Southern Europe, the Middle East, Africa. Uh, we have to overcome hunger. We have to create a world which is livable for every human being. We have to create a new paradigm uh, based on the common aims of mankind. We have to consciously initiate the next phase of the evolution of the human species, agree on joint space elaboration, uh, exploration. All the BRICS countries are space-traveling nations, and Europe and the United States have to accelerate their efforts to cooperate on that. We have to take the view of the astronauts, cosmonauts, and taikonauts, who when they look at the blue planet from outer space, they always say, there are no borders, and 
they realize how small our planet is in a very large solar system and an even larger galaxy in the middle of billions of galaxies. And if we want to exist in a hundred years, in a thousand years, in a hundred mi million years from now, we should prove that those geophysicists who say that mankind only arrived one second before 12 and will disappear one second after 12 are wrong. That mankind is the only so far known creative species. Vladimir Vernadsky said that the noosphere will, will gain more and more uh, dominance over the biosphere because the human creative process will become more important in the universe. And that is what we have to focus on because the future of mankind is one where the identity as a genius of each individual will become the rule. Each man becoming a genius in the future. But for that to arrive, beauty is a necessary condition of mankind. 